So good morning, everybody. This is Chuck Davis from Adaptive Solutions. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome everybody to this morning's uh, web session on VDI Virtual Desktop Technology. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we start today's session. Uh, first, the lines are muted for today's session so that we can keep the process of the presentation flowing. Uh, the session is being recorded during this uh, presentation this morning. So if there's someone else within your firm that wasn't able to attend and you'd like to share the session with them, uh, we will make that available to you on our website after the session concludes, and we'll be sending everyone a follow-up email uh, just to let them know where that session and slide deck information could be found. Um, also, the session's scheduled to run approximately 30 minutes. We're hoping to finish on time. If you do have any questions throughout the session, and there will be a break at the end for a Q&A session, please feel free to ask them through the GoToWebinar chat panel off to the right of your dashboard. And of course, uh, at the end of the session, we'll be holding a drawing so that one lucky participant uh, will win a $100 American Express gift card. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. OK, uh, so first I'd like to introduce to everyone Todd Barretts. Todd is our Chief Technology Officer here at Adaptive Solutions. He's been in the industry for approximately 20 years. Eight of those years here at Adaptive is our CTO. Uh, Todd is an expert in the area of Microsoft technologies, shared storage, and virtualization specific to desktops and servers. Uh, I'm going to let Todd, Todd say good morning to everyone. He will be co-presenting with me this morning. Todd, would you please say hello? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining. Great. Thanks, Todd. And of course, myself, Chuck Davis, I am president and a co-founding shareholder of Adaptive. Uh, I've been doing legal technology since 1990, coming up on 24 years. Um, I have a background as a network manager at two large Philadelphia law firms, and we'll be helping Todd through today's session. Uh, jumping to the next slide, I want to give you just a brief overview of our agenda for today. Um, the first half of the presentation will be handled by myself. I'll be taking you through a, uh, a very quick overview of Adaptive. I noticed that we have some existing clients on the line this morning, so I apologize. I, I know you guys know who we are, but there are a couple of few new folks just to give a little bit of background. Um, we're going to spend some time talking about what VDI is, uh, decoding this acronym and, and what firms are doing and why the market is looking at virtual desktop technology. We'll dig into that a little bit. And I'll wrap up on the players. What are the, uh, the technologies from a software-specific standard that firms are looking at and how they stack up in the industry? The second half of the session will be led by Todd Barretts. Uh, Todd will get into a technical conversation, but because the audience is a little bit of a mixed bag today. We have some technical people. We have some administrative people. We're going to keep it at a 10,000-foot view, but get into some of the nuts and bolts about um, you know, proper deployment methods, what you need to consider when you're doing a, a VDI design, and also talk about some of the gotchas. Uh, we've been through this project many times before, and one of the things we want to try and share here are some of the things you must look out for when you're considering a virtual desktop deployment within your firm. Um, at the end, we'll pause for that Q&A session, and of course, we'll wrap up with the, uh, with the gift card drawing at the very end of the webinar today. Okay? So without any further ado, I'm going to jump into a very brief overview of Adaptive as a company. Um, for those of you that know us, uh, we're, we're primarily a legal-specific systems integration consulting and managed service provider. That's a mouthful. Um, we do a lot. Uh, basically, we support IT infrastructure at over 300 law firms in the legal and corporate legal world. Uh, very much like a law firm ourselves, we have six discrete practice areas that we focus on. Um, one of them is managed service, where we actually do support of your infrastructure from a management patch and, and uh, monitoring standpoint. We have a hosted desktop product that we call Onboard for the smaller firms that are looking just to get out of the business of IT altogether. Uh, traditional network support or engineering services, which is really the core of Today's, pre today's presentation with VDI, uh, some of the areas that we focus on in our engineering world are listed here on this slide. Uh, your traditional desktop and server upgrade, shared storage, data backup, continuity, project management, those types of things. Uh, it's been a staple of our business since 1998. Uh, we also have a leading legal-specific help desk that is 24-7-365. We call that Extend IT. And we have two other divisions I'd like to mention. One of them is our learning division and development whereas we do traditional and cloud-based education and custom development of tools for the law firm's desktops. And we also have an ECM division that specializes in document, email, and records management, 
with a very, very strong focus on the HP Autonomy Worksite uh, product. Um, I will mention before I jump off this slide that we are a long-term supporter of both the ALA chapters and the ILTA organization. Very proud to be involved with those groups. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about virtual desktop infrastructure. And this slide is kind of funny. We're saying it's not your father's Osmobile. If you've bought a new car recently, um, obviously you know it's nothing like the car you bought 20 years ago. I mean, we're now at the point where you can hook up your smartphone, your car tells you how to get somewhere, um, you know, it gives you directions, it even tells the dealer when it's time to service the vehicle. Uh, such is the case with the legal desktop. If you've been in this business as long as we have, you'll understand that the legal desktop is substantially changing over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, firms that have tried to adopt virtual technology early on worked with what we refer to as the usual suspects off on the right-hand side, which was the Citrix Zen apps. If you go back far enough, um, you might even call that MetaFrame, uh, terminal server solutions, and even some lightweight tools like GoToMyPC for the attorney who likes to work from home. Uh, and while those tools did the job, what they lacked is they lacked the ability to deliver a lifelike experience on that desktop. Um, there were phenomenons that we called uh, session bleed over or performance impactors where when something happened that one user was doing, the other users would feel that. And we were not able to deliver a lifelike desktop. Things like audio, video, sound, um, technologies such as flash websites, or if you were an attorney reviewing large document discoveries, you would see screen paint issues. And that desktop just wasn't practical to use for a business desktop. Um, some of the things that BDI addresses is a change in that market where we get away from shared servers and single instances of Windows Server operating systems, and we move to a dedicated and true Windows 7 environment. So that outdated technology is changing through BDI, and we feel wholeheartedly that we're at the point where we can deliver a virtual desktop alternative that looks, feels, and performs on par with a physical desktop environment. And that's really the, the keystone piece of today's presentation, is talking about how we could accomplish that technology. Um, I will tell you that in our world at Adaptive, we have about going on probably 2,000 VDI desktops deployed in production in law firms. Uh, that's included across our cloud, which is called Onboard, as well as production uh, environments where law firms have actually adopted VDI technology. So we, we've got enough out there at this point that we can say with a straight face that the BDI systems are solid and they're performing up to our expectations and the expectation of what a busy attorney would like to use for his or her desktop. So what is VDI? What does that acronym mean? Basically, it's, it's the abbreviation for Virtual Desktop Infrastructure. And the definition that we have posted here is the verbose copy from Wikipedia. Um, what I'd like to talk about is you know, what makes it different, what the features and benefits are of a virtual desktop. And to start off, it, it allows us to deliver individual desktops for each person. In a Citrix, MetaFrame, ZenApp, or Terminal Server world, we have multiple users logging into a single instance of a Windows Server operating system. For example, it might be Server 2008, uh, made to look, a 2008 R2 made to look like Windows 7. In this case, in VDI, it's genuine Windows 7. So in cases or circumstances where softwares were not supported under Citrix or Terminal Server, because they were running on a, a server operating system, in many cases with VDI, those softwares work fine because we're using the same OS that's on a physical machine. We're using the same registry structure. It's, it's the same environment, essentially, just virtualized. By giving us these isolated machines, we're creating a one-to-one -one effect for users to have a machine that belongs to them. And the example I, I usually give to folks is you know, a stack of red plastic cups that you'd see at a summer picnic. Think of the cup on the bottom as the master copy of the VDI desktop. It contains your Windows operating system, your document management, your, your email and office software, and all of your practice applications. Each time a user logs into the network, another cup is taken off the stack and placed on the table. If 50 people log in, 50 cups are, are you know, surrounding the table and distributed. And the circular nature of that cup represents the ring that we're creating around the individual user's machine meaning that they have so much processor assigned. They have so much RAM memory assigned to that desktop. So what their neighbor does down the hall doesn't so much affect what their user experience is. They're running inside a protected memory ring. Um, by doing this, we deliver a higher definition user experience um, using technologies like through Citrix's HDX protocol, the high definition experience. We can give people flash, video, sound, 
um, all the experiences you'd like to see. Uh, a good case in point for us and how long we've been doing this is we had a customer that deployed VDI to about 55 desktops and they told us it's working well. We all watched the Casey Anthony verdict over VDI. That's going back a couple of few years ago, but that's how long we've had VDI desktops in production if you think back a little bit. Um, the other nice thing from an IT perspective and maybe from a financial perspective for the firm is that you're delivering an Anywhere Access Federated desktop, meaning that your desktop is your desktop. No longer does the network team have to manage the you know, 100 local computers and the remote access system. They're managing the virtual desktop infrastructure. So whether that attorney is working at his or her desk in the building, they're traveling from the road and using their laptop, or perhaps they're working late that night at home trying to get a document finalized for the client, they can log into that Follow Me desktop from wherever they are using whatever device, which leads us to the last acronym, which is the BYOD, or Bring Your Own Device. In today's world, we're finding that attorneys don't want to work on the traditional desktop. They like to use their tablets, they're using iPads, they're using thin client devices. We finally can say yes to that attorney that we've been saying no to, that they could use their MacBook Air as their endpoint device. So BYOD is definitely a viable option in the BDI world. The next slide was recently taken from the ILTA 2014 technology survey that was just released, I believe, in November of this year after the August conference. And what this is telling us on the left is which statement represents your firm's position on virtual desktop infrastructure. And what's interesting is that a good third of the respondents say that they are either researching and or testing, not in active production, but are looking at VDI. So they're evaluating that technology, which is good. That means that the market is actually considering virtual desktop alternatives. Uh, if you look down a little bit on that slide, you'll notice that there are some firms reporting that they have an active VDI rollout already engaged, and there also are some firms reporting that they are fully rolled out with VDI. Obviously, the percentages still favor the physical desktop world, but we're moving in the right direction, and we feel that virtual desktops are a viable option at this point. This is not um, you know, bleeding edge anymore. It's, it's not even cutting edge. This is becoming mainstream technologies for, for law firms and law firm IT people. On the right-hand side of this screen, you'll notice a slide that talks about what platform is your firm using for virtual desktop infrastructure and easy to see that it's dominated by Citrix and VMware. And we're going to talk a little bit about the big three in the next slide, who they are, what they're offering, and, and why you might want to consider different technologies. But definitely some validation here that the market is looking at VDI. Not hugely saturated yet, in all fairness, but definitely moving in that direction to some extent. Okay, so the big three players. Who are the VDI representatives out there? Um, the top one is Citrix Zen Desktop. Uh, the most recent version is 7.6. And in our opinion, they still seem to be the pack leader. Uh, it's the product that we've standardized on here at Adaptive that we use for our data center and that we've deployed to most of our customers. Citrix has been in the desktop virtualization world for quite some time, and they, they have a leg up, if you will, on delivering a virtual experience to an end user, and they're doing a good job. Um, the nice thing about the Citrix product is that you can run it on a variety of hypervisors. You can run it on the included Zen server hypervisor that comes at no charge as part of your license subscription, or you can run it on top of the Microsoft Hyper-V hypervisor or the VMware ESX hypervisor. Uh, looking at a VMware ESX environment, you can manage it through that single pane of glass through your vCenter, so you're not having to manage two separate and distinct virtual infrastructures, one for your servers, one for your desktops. Uh, we have found great success, and I think Todd will talk a little more about this, about the platforms and, and, and what works and what, would, what doesn't work so great as he goes under the hood. Um, the next option is VMware's product, which is now called Horizon View. They got a little cutesy. It used to just be called VMware View. It now sounds like a managed healthcare organization, Horizon View. It probably should belong to Blue Cross. Um, they've been in the market of virtualization for quite some time with a, with a strong focus, obviously, in server virtualization. And the reality is they're catching up, and they're catching up very quickly. Um, VMware has been the pack leader for a long time in server virtualization, but their desktop product is coming into, um, I guess, par with what we're seeing from the Zen App product. We, as a IT provider, do have several clients that are running the Horizon View product with, with good results, both in a uh, non-persistent and, in some cases, a persistent desktop model. And obviously, it, it wouldn't be an IT uh, conversation without Microsoft being involved. Microsoft has their own virtual desktop infrastructure platform. 
Um, the honest to goodness truth is that we at Adaptive have not had much exposure to this yet, but from our research, we're finding that it seems to be a little bit behind. It's still playing catch up, and the architecture itself seems to be a little better suited to the smaller firm at this point. So as you look at this market, in our professional opinion, Zen Desktop and Horizon View are, are the two pack leaders and the ones that we see most people using uh, going to market with in their BDI deployments. So with that, I'm going to hand off over to Todd, who's going to jump into the facts and features, talk a little bit about some of the technical challenges and the, the differences between the product, and then I'll be back with you as we wrap up the webinar. Thank you. And Todd, I'm going to pass the ball to you, please. Thank you, Chuck. Okay, so there are a number of different VDI deployment models that you could take. Uh, obviously, you could do a full enterprise deployment where you decide to put all of your desktops in a VDI environment. But maybe you want to go with a hybrid approach and just sort of test the waters, and that's where you would give specific workers or maybe a remote office location the VDI, and then as you work with the, with the uh, product, you can see whether or not it meets your needs. And then the next most common approach would be just as a remote access mechanism where you're replacing your Zen app or your terminal server with a VDI model just to provide a better experience for your users that are working remotely. And then there's also cloud options. And I think Chuck mentioned this before. You can go with a managed service provider that would actually have your desktop out in the cloud. And then all of your users from wherever they are would be able to access that, that VDI from the cloud. And so if you take a look, VDI does now look and feel much more like a regular desktop. And that is due to a lot of the progress that has been made recently with the protocols that the vendors are using. For instance, Citrix HDX protocol and the PCOI protocol from VMware now can we provide a much better look and feel. They are able to extrapolate and allow some of the heavy duty processing to occur on the local machines and they can really thin out the data that's being passed along and that helps us with things like large documents and PDFs which in the old world used to paint every time you would flip a page you would have to wait as the screen painted down. And even watching flash based videos or rich media with sound now look and feel just like they would on a regular desktop. And that is due to all of these special protocols that have been implemented to help make the look and feel of VDI that much better. And so the value that you get from a VDI desktop is that it allows you to not just virtualize but centralize the desktop. And now you have all of that running from your data center where you can control it and you can have your hands on it at any time. You don't have to go walk out to somebody's desk if there's a problem. You can go and you can see the whole thing right from the data center. It simplifies application updates and deployment. If you are using a non-persistent desktop, for instance, you can do all of your updates and update all of your applications one time and then push it out to all of the users. And the next time they log on, they pick up all of those changes. No more dealing with the SCCM or trying to push out updates with WSUS or walking around to everybody's desktop to install an application. It can now be done centrally. And that can be a huge time saver. And as Chuck mentioned before, bring your own device. That is huge, especially for attorneys nowadays, a lot of whom like to work from their tablet device, whether they're at the office or at home or on vacation. And that provides a really nice benefit for all of your users. And those things together can help reduce the cost of ownership. And it can also help provide some disaster recovery depending upon where you are hosting all of this, um, all of the applications. So in other words, if you have a co-location center or you're running your VDI from the cloud, if you were to lose your office, you would not lose your desktop. And that can also provide a lot of value. Next slide, Chuck, please. So if we take a look under the hood, what's required? Perhaps the most important thing in a VDI implementation is the storage. And not just any storage. It's got to be fast storage and storage that can handle a great deal of load. 
And we use a special term in the industry to measure the speed of that storage, IOPS, or input output operations per second. And it's important to have a storage mechanism that can handle a lot of IOPS because you're going to be running desktops off of that storage. And so when you have a regular physical desktop and you have that storage local, it's very easy to get good performance. But now that you're virtualizing all of this and it's sitting in a data center, you need that storage to be fast and to be able to deliver that information as quickly as possible. And so the storage is an extremely important part of a VDI implementation. Another thing that is sometimes overlooked, the server hosts. Obviously, you're running everybody's desktop on a couple servers, so you need to make sure that you have spare servers because you're going to lose one sooner or later. Something's going to go down for some reason, and you don't want to be left with people who can't work because one of the hosts is down. So you need to make sure that you allot for extra hosts. The other thing you need to plan for is bandwidth. You need to make sure that for your implementation, for the way your employees work, that you have enough bandwidth to meet your needs. And that could be office bandwidth if you're doing this internally in your office. If you're doing it for remote users, it may be bandwidth to a remote location, whether it's over the internet or whether it's a point-to-point -point line. You need to make sure that you have enough of that. And as far as the back end goes, that can be flexible. You can run on different manufacturers. You can run with different hypervisors. A lot of that will depend upon what you choose for your VDI. And as Chuck had already mentioned, the front end is also flexible. And perhaps that's one of the best parts about VDI. You can use a desktop to connect. You can use a laptop. You can use a tablet. You could even use your phone. I'm not sure that you could actually get anything done while working on a phone, but I have seen people do it. And then there's something else to consider, a provisioning method. And provisioning is really how you make your desktop. And there are a couple of different provisioning methods, and depending on which one you choose, it could have an effect on your space and on the complexity of your implementation. So one of the ways that you can provision desktops is what we call streaming. That's where, and I think Chunk alluded to this earlier, you have a master image, and everyone gets a copy of that. And what that does is it saves on storage, because you only really have one desktop that's, say, 40 or 50 gig in size, and then these other desktops that are copied from that are really only taking about 5 or 10 gig a piece. And that can be a huge savings in storage. But unfortunately, it is also a lot more complex to manage and to set up. So there's that trade-off there that has to be considered. Another possible provisioning method would just be a one-to-one. -one. For every user who needs a desktop, they're going to get a full virtual desktop implementation. And conceptually, that's much simpler, but obviously it takes a lot more space and requires that your storage be able to handle all of that. And so it's just one of the things that needs to be considered as you're doing an implementation. And of course, no discussion would be complete without mentioning security because that is ever present anymore in IT organizations. Not only the certificates that you're going to need, but the firewalls and how you're going to lock this thing down because probably it's going to be open out on the internet. That's one of the, the big values of having a VDI is that it can be accessed remotely. And so anything you put out there on the internet obviously has to be locked down. Chuck, next slide, please. Which brings us to the planning and delivery methods. So it is important when you're planning out your VDI that you take a look at all of the different pieces to make sure that you're going to deliver what your users need. And you want to start with the user experience. What kind of users do you have? Do you have task workers? Do you have power users? Knowing who they are and how they work is going to be important because it will help you choose your back end, how much storage you need, how fast the storage has to be, and maybe even the type of hypervisor that you're going to use. You need to assess your apps. What are your core apps? It's probably Microsoft Office, maybe a document management system, maybe a few others. You want to make sure that whatever apps you're choosing, you understand how they work on a desktop and how much load they put on there. Even Office, different versions of Office carry different weights, and some are faster than others. Then, of course, there's your specialty apps, things that maybe only go on one or two desktops. How are you going to handle that? Are you going to bundle that into your primary image, 
or you're going to stream that over to your users maybe through a Zen app or a terminal server. Or do you have users exit VDI altogether to use these specialty apps on maybe a local machine? Those, will be, those decisions will be important to determine all of what you need in the back end. And then, of course, the product selection, the Citrix, the VMware, the Microsoft. And obviously, there are other vendors out there. Maybe one of them is right for you. But for the majority of people, probably your primary vendors like a Citrix or VMware are going to be the best fit. And what you choose will determine you know, how you're going to deliver, how you're going to manage and how it's going to look and feel for the users. So then there's the infrastructure planning. And when you're looking for a manufacturer for your host, I always recommend tier one hardware. Things like a Dell, an HP, an IBM. A, a VDI system is a terrible place for a white box piece of hardware that frankly is going to be very difficult to troubleshoot when it doesn't work and may have very spotty support. When you're going to put all of your users and all of your eggs onto a VDI system, go with the Tier 1 hardware. The next thing, users per host. In general, all things being equal, I like to recommend no more than 50 or 60 people per host. Now, is it possible to get more people than that on a single host? Sure. But then the hardware cost really skyrockets and it becomes less viable to actually acquire something like that. So you'll find that you know, that limit is pretty good. And in some cases, you'll even want less than that, depending upon how your users work and how much processing power they need. And then, as I mentioned before, redundancy. You have to plan for the fact that you're going to lose a host one day, and everybody's going to have to run in fewer machines than you had originally acquired. So let me give you an example. Say you have a 120 user firm. Well, you're going to need three servers, each with 256 gig of RAM. And how do I figure that? Well, I assume that that third host is going to crash. And so now I've got to run all of my users on two servers. And if I don't want to exceed the limit of about 60 users per host, that means I'm going to need two hosts. And if I'm going to assume that uh, each of my users needs four gig of RAM to run comfortably, that's 240 gig of RAM right there. And then the host itself is going to need some memory. So you're going to add about 16 gig for the host, and you're going to come out with 256 gig of RAM over three hosts. Now, that would put about 40 users per host on a good day, and you may even find that you couldn't stand to run 60 users on a host, depending on your users. So maybe you'll decide that you'll even need four machines to make things work the way you wanted to. But those are some of the decisions you're going to want to make up front. Chuck, next slide, please. And then there's the desktop control methods. And these are also really critical. How are you going to handle your user profiles? Group policies. Are you going to be using app locker? And why is desktop control so important? It's important because it affects your login time, your overall performance, and your desktop consistency. Nobody wants to log into a desktop and wait five minutes for your start menu to appear. And certainly nobody wants to log in every day and have to reset their, all their desktops, redo all their favorites, change their colors, set their background. So you want to make sure that you test and vet out and plan for having your user profile managed. And managed properly because a large user profile takes forever to download on a VDI system. So you want to make sure that it's controlled and properly maintained. You want to make sure that your desktop is consistent. Every day when somebody logs in, they should get their desktop. And it should look the same as it did when they logged off the day before. And so desktop control is critical to the success of any VDI implementation. Chuck, next slide, please. And of course, no discussion of VDI would be complete without the gotchas. And the first one, perhaps the most important, is that the cost of entry may be higher. And in fact, it probably will unless you are a very large company and already have a lot of the components that are already needed. So you have to be aware that just buying regular desktops is sometimes a little bit cheaper. So you have to think about yourself and the, the total cost of ownership as to whether or not it's worth it to your firm to have some of the benefits that VDI offers. Also, the, the technology is a lot more sophisticated. It's more complex to support. So you want to ask yourself, do I have the people in-house that can support this? Or am I going to team up with a third-party vendor to help me? 
and the VDI desktop is unfortunately not 100% virus free. So off the top of my head, I can just tell you CryptoLocker, for instance, can penetrate a VDI system because it saves itself to the profile. And as I talked about in the last slide, we need to save the profile off in order to maintain desktop consistency. So it is possible for one of these systems to become infected and have to be cleaned. And then there's Outlook performance considerations. Generally speaking, you do not use cache mode Outlook on a VDI system. And so that can ha have a huge impact to how Outlook performs. If you are running Office 65, 365 for instance, uh, normally you would want that in cache mode. That's how you get the good performance. And if you can't do that on a VDI system, well that could really have a huge impact. Now obviously there's, there's ways around that and things that can be done, but it's just something to consider. Profile performance, as I mentioned before, if it's not handled properly, Login times are atrocious and people will not be happy. You have to plan for the one-off applications. In the good old days with a physical desktop, you have an application someone needs, fine, you just install it in their machine and bam, you're done. Well, you can't do that anymore in a VDI desktop. You have to plan for it. You have to come up with how you're going to manage that. Are you going to stick it in your image? Are you going to stream it to them? Are you going to make them use their local desktop? All of that has to be planned for. And of course, bandwidth and backup lines. If you have a remote office, that's running on VDI and they have an internet connection and that's how they get to their desktop. What happens when that internet connection goes down? Does that desktop, does that remote office just sit there idle and they do nothing until the internet returns or do you put a backup line in there? And obviously that backup line is going to have a cost associated with it. And you're going to have to test it and make sure that it works. And VDI systems tend to scale better as firm size increases and I think I alluded to that a little bit earlier. These larger firms tend to have a lot more hardware in place already, and so it tends to be a little bit cheaper for them to implement and, and to work with. So next slide. And Chuck, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you, Todd. That was some great information that I think you shared, obviously, at a 10,000-foot at a level. And if anybody wants to dive deeper on any of those points, we would welcome a, a follow-up conversation. Um, I will mention that Todd's right. This really comes down to total cost of ownership. We've had some great successes in deploying VDI to firms as small as 40 or 50 people, but it's when the consideration is taken that they're looking at not only reducing their, their CapEx costs, but they're looking at reducing their operational support costs over the next three to four years, and that's where it tends to make sense. If you're just stacking this up hardware for hardware, you know, servers and VDI against machines, Machines will probably always win, uh, just strictly from a budget standpoint. But one of the cool things about VDI is that you finally can tell your users, yes, you get a new computer every day. When they log into the system in the morning, a new computer is generated for them. When they log off at night, their profile is saved and the workstation is destroyed, essentially. And each day, a new streamed, non-persistent session is created, thereby reducing cost of ownership out of the box. So there are lots of great things about VDI, uh, but budget, uh, unfortunately, is not always one of them. So with that, I'm going to pause and see if we have any questions that people would like to ask regarding the VDI session. I'll remind you that those questions could be submitted through the questions chat panel off on the right-hand side, and it looks like somebody is a fastest finger and has one coming in. Somebody's asking Todd um, about the Office 365 and the email. What are some of the workarounds? So some of the workarounds could be creating a larger cache or a larger disk size so that you can indeed cache off your mailbox. Another thing that can be done is you can take a network drive and you can cache off your mailbox to that. Now, strictly speaking, that's not recommended, but I have had some success with doing just that. Uh, another possibility would be uh, to use a more persistent desktop where you actually cache your data file and it sits there on that same desktop. Um, but some of those things, you know, they have their pluses and minuses, but those are just some of the things that you can do okay. if you have Office 365. Good information. And we have time for one more because we're running a couple of minutes after. Uh, the next question, Todd, is can you give an idea of how long it takes a non-persistent desktop to boot? Well, it, it, the, the short answer is it can be as fast as 30 seconds. However, if you're booting up 100 machines at the same time, it's not going to be 30 seconds. So the end result is if everything is done right and you size your storage properly, 
and you get the right type of host and you have the good number of hosts, a single desktop will boot between 30 seconds and 45 seconds. And in a large, what we call boot storm, where you have a large number of machines booting at once, you can get those machines up in several minutes. Uh, if it's done wrong, it could take several hours. So it all comes down to the implementation and the planning. Great. Thank you. And if anybody has any more, up oh, we have one more, Todd. I'm going to try and squeeze it in. Uh, what is the typical back-end storage used for implementations? Typically, I recommend SAS-based disks because they're faster. Uh, if you can, and this, a lot of this depends on your size, but some type of hybrid base SAN with SSD disks and SAS disks works best. The SSD is really great when you're booting things up. That boot storm that I mentioned just before where you have 100 machines coming up at once, SSD disks have a lot of IOPS and they can boot those machines really quickly. And then when they're in steady state, they can move over to those SAS drives where they tend to perform better under normal working conditions. So I like the hybrid SANs and you can get them from a lot of vendors. I know Dell sells them and I believe NetApp and EMC. So all of the major players. Just to elaborate on that, Todd, from my, my own perspective, what do you think about these devices that actually have their own internal storage built in versus using a highly available sh uh, SAN storage system? Are you a fan? Uh, I'm not a huge fan. I like the SANs because they tend to be, like you said, more highly available, and they tend to be more flexible. Okay, great. Well, we're getting a little bit late, so I'm going to jump on to the next slide, which is just to give you guys an overview right before our drawing of what the upcoming webinar schedule looks like for 2015. Um, if you missed our last couple of webinars uh, over the month of November and December, they are available on our website. We touched on our managed service. We touched on our blended learning options. Uh, I believe that was last week with Marianne Malber, our Director of Learning and Development. Coming up in 2015, we're going to jump into our Your Docs template and macro package. We're very happy to announce that our, our numbering suite is finally done. Um, be on the lookout for something for that. We're going to kind of ramrod you guys into getting off of Windows Server 2003. It's getting close to the end for that operating system. Believe it or not, there are still a lot of firms out there running and supporting that. And as we move into the year, we're going to talk a little bit about cloud, uh, the concepts of, Microsoft, of Mimecast and Office 365, marrying two clouds together, you know, essentially reducing your digital footprint for email, but putting a, a stopgap in with Mimecast and having good continuity in place. We'll also jump into App, uh, Azure with Microsoft and looking at redundancy in the cloud for your primary data center. And then we'll be wrapping up with learning management systems and talking a little bit about worksite archiving specific to the document management system. So please, uh, with your permission, we'll keep you guys on the list and invite you to those upcoming sessions. So at this point of the session, uh, I'd like to go ahead and pick a name out of the hat for the drawing today, make somebody's Christmas just a little bit brighter, and help them with their shopping. Uh, and the name of today's winner for the $100 Amex is John Baylor. I think I'm saying that right, B-A-I-L-E-R. John, you are the lucky recipient. We appreciate your time, and we'll be in touch with you to get that gift card out to you in time for the holidays. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap up with a big thank you on behalf of everyone at Adaptive, specifically myself and Todd Barrett, for giving us just a little bit of your time this morning. Hopefully you learned a little bit more about VDI, what the market's doing, and what you need to consider as you start looking at deployments. Uh, the last thought I'll leave you with is a great way to get involved in VDI is to start with a pilot deployment. We've had many firms that have gone to pilot, stood up a small, anything from five users to 25 users, maybe a little larger in some of the bigger firms, just to test drive the product, give it to some of your busy attorneys. Have your IT people try that desktop. Um, oftentimes, that's what it takes to get a project like this approved. So with that, again, thank you for your time. It's been our pleasure, and we're going to sign off. Enjoy your holidays.